Hey guys, Jim Vanosky with Manufacturing Talks. It's time again for our quarterly economic education episode. We are here with the guys from Aprio, Simeon and Michael. They're here to talk about all things manufacturing from their insights report that they do quarterly um, on manufacturing and supply. And so they're going to be with us in a minute. We're going to do a deep dive into all things economy when it comes to manufacturing. Right here on Manufacturing Talks. Stay tuned. Welcome to Manufacturing Talks with Jim Vanosky. Industry has a million cool stories, and Jim talks to the movers and shakers who are making them happen. Let's dive in. Welcome back to Manufacturing Talks. I'm Jim Vanosky, your host. Always great to have the guys from Aprio here. Um, they, they bring the best insight into what's going on in the world of manufacturing from an economic standpoint. I've got Simeon Wallace and Michael Lang with me today. Hi guys, how you doing? Doing good. fantastic. Thank hey Jim, you. how are you? Good, good. Uh, welcome back to you, Simeon, and welcome for the first time, Michael. Thank you. So real quick, Simeon, uh, give us the top line of what you do for Aprio. Sure. So I'm our chief investment officer, which means that I help set the investment strategy for our wealth management and family office business. But as part of that role, my team and I spend a lot of time looking at what's going on in the economy, what's going on in the capital markets, how they intersect, so that we can uh, help not just our clients, but also the firm's clients overall and work with people like Michael. Uh, one area of interest for me in particular is manufacturing and distribution. Uh, I started my Wall Street career as an analyst in that space, and it's kind of always stuck with me. Excellent. And Michael, how about you? Yeah. So I. I'm a leader in our firm's manufacturing practice. And what that means is this is a group that started 20 years ago. And 20 years ago, we formed out of your traditional tax and compliance work to, to work with our clients to mitigate risk. But what we found over the past 20 years is, is manufacturers needed a lot more than that. So now we spend our time not only managing risk, but focusing on opportunities and looking forward for our clients, whether that be transaction advisory, wealth management, uh, risk advisory, IT assurance, whatever it is, our goal is to be that partner with the manufacturer all the way through that life cycle. Got it. Okay. Well, and so you guys do your quarterly uh, insights report on manufacturing and distribution. And that's what we're here to talk about is that latest report. And since you are the manufacturing guy, Michael, I'm going to come to you with this first question. So last time we talked when, when I chatted with Adam and Simeon, you guys were pretty bullish on where manufacturing was headed in the quarter previously. Now, yeah. this latest report, I've gone over it. It's, it's not as bullish to me, but you know, what's your insight going into this coming quarter? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, it's an interesting one too, right? And if, as you said, if you read that report, and I'm sure Simeon will touch on it, there's some conflicting data. Uh, there's some positives and negatives. But I think by and large, the, the terminology you'll probably hear uh, throughout our conversation today is cautiously optimistic. And I say that because, you know, if you looked at our manufacturers 16 months ago and you asked them, where would they be today? I, I, I think they're in a much stronger position today than they would have thought 16 months ago. Mm -hmm. And there's all kinds of reasons for that, right? Uh, but th they've adjusted to the interest rate environment that we're working through. They've adjusted to the capitalization of R&D expenses from tax purposes, which has been a real burden for them. But they've also done a really good job of managing costs through this period of time of uncertainty. Mm. Um, so as I look at their balance sheets, I look at the, the cash flow, they're in a much stronger position than I think we would have expected that time frame. And Simeon, I'm sure you have some insights into maybe why that is, but kind of what we're seeing on our side. Yeah. Okay. And so we are cautiously optimistic. Some of the leading indicators within manufacturing have been pretty positive. So, or the data is getting less negative. And so when you think about what that kind of first and second derivative, they're headed in the right direction. Uh, yeah. But that's at a macro picture. I think if you break down manufacturing into different parts of the manufacturing world, you'll get a little bit of a different story. You know, one of the things that we're noticing is that a lot of construction related manufacturing is still going on, which is positive, especially mm -hmm. um, construction into the manufacturing sector. So if you think about additional plants, that's booming. That's up nearly two to three times what it traditionally had been in kind of the prior five to 10 years. 
Um, where we are seeing more weakness is when we look at what's going on in the transportation side. And so whether it's rail car loadings or some of what's going on with truck tonnage or even containers coming to the U.S. from, from Asia, that data has been a lot weaker. Uh, and so essentially you, you have a lot of kind of the infrastructure going into place, which is good, but the actual movement of, of goods has been slower than expected. So that's created some of that more mixed picture for us. So let's go back to that construction piece, because that's one thing that really leaped out to me as I looked at this report from the latest quarter is just this enormous uptick in plant building, which, you know, for a manufacturing guy like me should be really, really good news. Um, but as I dig into the drivers, a lot of it to me is related to government money, subsidies and uh, the IRA that, you know, shovels money at these clean energy uh, uh, producers of, of things like solar panels and things like that. My concern is that we might be creating a bit of a bubble. Mm -hmm. And so uh, you guys have any insight on that? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in first. The, we are creating, I'll say, a lot of uh, stronger demand than usual, than normal. So I don't know if we would call it a bubble, but I think it's fair to assume in, in years out from here that it won't be at these same levels. But we do yeah. have a period of time where it will remain strong. And some of this is definitely driven by government initiatives. When we think about the, the energy transition, when we think about things like the CHIPS Act and trying to bring certain types of manufacturing for strategic reasons for the country back onto our shores, that is gonna be here for, for multiple years. But there's also a part of it, which is companies saying, we wanna have more security within our own supply chains. And we're gonna manufacture core components here that are not necessarily driven by government spending. And yeah. that's part of this too. So, you know, in round numbers uh, over the last five or 10 years, we were averaging around 75 billion of spending on manufacturing um, infrastructure and construction. And more recently, the data has been over 200 billion, right? So that big jump is not something that we should all bank on being there with us for the long run. But while it's here, we need to acknowledge that some of this is, I'd say more secular and some of this is gonna be a little bit more cyclical. Got it. Just to touch on that, I, I think, to Simeon's point, this is one of those reasons for optimism. The, the investment that is taking place in North American manufacturing. Um, your comment on was it subsidy driven? I, I think it's a lot more than that. I, I think there's part of it is that. And, but a lot of it is the security of the supply chain. Mm -hmm. Right. And this started, you know, five years ago when we talked about the conflict going on with China, the trade war back then. And there was there was a real conversation that was taking place with our clients about diversifying away from China. Well, mm -hmm as what you've seen play out throughout the globe in recent years, I think it's been moved beyond just diversifying away from China, but securitizing your supply chain, nearshoring, reshoring it. We've seen a lot of investment, not only here in Georgia and throughout the United States, but also right across the border in Mexico. And I, I think that's gonna be a trend for a little bit. Now, whether or not it's sustainable is a different conversation, but it's optimistic. Yep. Let's dive into that element a little more because I've been looking at reshoring quite a bit lately. And uh, you're right. It started um, back five, six years ago with the concern that China was doing its saber rattling and we were so heavily dependent on them. And then of course we had the pandemic when things just broke down and you had all the backups and inability to get stuff from over there. And now it's not like it stopped, you know, you've got the, the unrest in the Middle East and the problems with um, the Red Sea and just seems like we've gotten into a, a pattern now where for a long time, these halfway around the world supply chains worked great and now they don't. And people are realizing you can't you know, put all your eggs in the business basket uh, on those far flung supply chains. So do you see that as being something <clears throat> sustaining where people are going to at least in part pull things either to America or closer in, you know, as you said, near shoring. I'll jump in first if you're right, Simeon. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I absolutely do. Um, I, I will say, I, I think it's an interesting point with everything you see going on in the news, the Red Sea, the shipping lanes, uh, our manufacturers by and large, and I'm not saying that there's not people impacted, the supply chains have remained pretty resilient despite all of that. But I do think there is a risk mitigation going on. To your point, what everybody experienced during COVID, the uncertainty surrounding uh, China and the Asian 
just continent in general. Yeah. I think there's real concern. And how do we reduce the risk and control our fate moving forward and not put our fate into kind of the, the global uh, events? Yeah, we, I mean, we're seeing foreign direct investment in China go down and go negative. It's fascinating when you hear large companies talking about this on their earnings calls, how if we were five or eight, 10 years ago, how much China was a part of the growth plan and now how much is de-emphasized the migration to more uh, manufacturing in places like India, Vietnam, Thailand, that's part of it. But I think other another part of it is that there's a level of comfort in what they call friend shoring, right? Even if it's not happening on our shores, if it's happening in places where we feel that the rule of law and geopolitically that we're aligned, a lot more comfortable with. You know, it, it harkens back to if we rewind the clock and I'll date myself a little bit, uh, when the Berlin Wall fell down and really the 1990s, you saw this large expansion into starting to go to lower cost manufacturing places because there was such labor cost disparity between what would have traditionally been kind of third world and communist and now has starting to embrace capitalism more that parity uh, or that difference has moved cl much closer to parity. So now you can make decisions on other factors such as security because you're not penalized as much for, for that cost differential. And that's where we are today. And so security becomes even more pressing as the world seems to have kind of split along these different axes between kind of that China, Russia axis versus what's more of a, a NATO and kind of North American axis. Yep. I had, uh, Harry Moser, who's the president of the reshoring initiative on a few episodes ago, and he made the point really emphatically that because of kind of that lull in anything major from a geopolitical standpoint happening after the wall came down and that that move to go to the low cost uh, labor countries for manufacturing, that people really weren't taking into account the total cost of having those uh, supply chains stretching halfway around the world. And that now with the disruptions we've seen over the past, you know, three, four or five years that now people are understanding, yeah, we weren't really completely taking into account what this is potentially costs us, the risks and all that. And so do you see that there's been that education around that? Okay. Yeah. On the face of things that may look a lot cheaper in China, but if you really dig into you know, possibility for lost sales like we had during the yeah. pandemic that, that the equation changes? You definitely have seen it. I'm not sure how well companies were able to quantify 20 or 30 years ago what the geopolitical costs are versus today. And yeah. you know, candidly, the, the leadership in, in places like China today is very different perspective than the leadership 20 years ago, 30 years ago. So that has to be added into to this equation. And it's why a lot of big companies hire uh, people who can kind of consult to them on, on geopolitics and yeah. thinking that through. But for the average company, you really don't have that opportunity nearly as much. Uh, but this is, this is part of the big change where that cost of uh, geopolitical risk uh, starts to become a bigger piece of the pie when thinking about, you know, how do we figure out what the total cost is for, for supplying in different parts of the world? Yeah. And then Michael is our manufacturing guy. I certainly, from where I sit, see a lot more um, push into advanced automation. Is that going to be a factor that plays into the making us more competitive here in, in the U.S. and nearby? Absolutely. Right. And I think this has been a common theme, something we've heard about for years. Right. We've known this is coming down the pipeline, the automation, the AI, the technology that's there particularly as we work with small to medium sized manufacturers, what you're starting to see is that technology truly get pushed down, becoming cost effective and being coming more mainstream. That's a trend that I think is undoubtedly here to stay. Um, I'm going to be interested to see how quick the, the adoption is. Um, we, we do an annual survey, a national survey for manufacturers. You can find it on our website. There's some really great data in there. And what you're finding is most manufacturers are aware of these technologies. They're planning and investing in these technologies. The adoption rate's still not there. They, they've only touched the tip of the iceberg, but that's going to be interesting to see as we continue to do that survey, how those trends play out. Yeah, for sure. Good. Okay. So um, Simeon, you mentioned the transportation data that is looking uh, decidedly weak, uh, but another, another element of the data that you guys use every quarter in your report is the ISM survey, the Institute for Supply Managers. And that picture looks a little more positive, right? 
It does. We're, we're seeing with that a lot of the leading indicators into the ultimate index. So the index has scored anything above 50 is a signal of expansion and below 50 is a signal of contraction. We're seeing the leading indicators there move in a much more positive direction. So, which gives us confidence that we'll finally cross that 50 threshold that we've been below for the better part of a year and a half right. and, and get us really kind of back to, to positivity. Yeah. How about you, Michael? What are you seeing in that regard? I think it kind of goes back to what we started off with. It's, it's the reason that we're cautiously optimistic moving forward. Um, we know there's challenges. We know if you look at the data, right, we, we talked about this conflicting data, but it's by and large the reason we're cautiously optimistic looking at manufacturers moving forward in the coming years. Yeah, one of the things that we've, we've talked about internally is that you know, order books are, are remaining resilient and the inventory situation in general has been worked through. So a lot of the difficulties, not all of them, but a lot of the difficulties associated with supply chains and making sure all the components were, were resolved, that has been essentially uh, resolved for the most part, for the for the, the vast majority. I'm sure there are, there are yeah. one-off situations. So if you have a good sense of kind of where your inventories are and you understand what your future order book looks like and it helps you do a lot more planning and that gives you more confidence in, in what the numbers could look like. And that leads to some of the optimism that we're talking about. Yeah. Well, as a bicyclist, I will tell you that in the bicycle industry world, people are still worried about their inventories because they have not <laughs> normalized and, and we're still sitting on a lot of bikes out there. So if you guys are in the market for a bike, now's a good time. <laughs> I remember you, I was looking for a bike and, and probably July or, or August of 2020, and there was like a six month waiting list. It yeah. Oh, it's a total swing. Yeah, for sure. Uh, when, when COVID hit, it's interesting you say that. I, my wife was in the market for a bike that spring and we went into our local shop and we were just going to look and they happened to have exactly what she was looking for. So we grabbed it. I went back two weeks later to pick up just some general stuff for myself. They had not a single bike in the shop. But so, I, yeah, it's been a wild swing for sure. Yeah. I do think, Jim, it, it's an interesting conversation, right? You, you bring up the bike and, and the impact to you as a, a consumer. But mm -hmm. it's the same thing our clients were dealing with kind of as they went through COVID. And so when you talk about inventory levels, and I, I think a large part of this is, is a reshaping of the way manufacturers are evaluating their inventory, right? Mm -hmm. for, for years, that, that, that conversation was just-in-time inventory. Don't right. want to tie up cash on the balance sheet. It was, a, it was a conversation every manufacturer is working towards. Yep. And I think manufacturers now are looking for somewhere in between. Yeah. You don't want too much, right? You don't want to tie up that cash. You don't want to have excess inventory. But you also don't want to be in a position where you're not there to deliver for your consumers and your consumers yep. now go somewhere else. Yep. And so I don't know how that's going to shake out, but I do think some of it, the, the inventory levels we're seeing is, does relate to that. Yeah, it's interesting because in, in my discussions with manufacturers, you, you do see that just in time isn't gone. It's certainly still valued as a philosophy, but I think there was an education that that works great as long as it works great. <laughs> right. And, right. And, you know, inventory is a cost. You're right. And so people were paring that down and paring that down and saving themselves those pennies. And when COVID hit and you couldn't get stuff, yeah. all of a sudden miss sales, you're losing dollars. Yeah. And so there's definitely been a recalibration on, okay, just in time, but... Well, right. and one thing I would say that the period from 2008 through 2020 for the economy and especially for manufacturing was very slow growth, it was mm -hmm. below historical growth levels. And so yeah. if you are in a slower growth environment, you're going to look at your costs and where you're tying up your capital even more aggressively because you're going to still have to want to protect your bottom line. If you are in a generally higher growth environment, which we have been more recently and there is a case why we could be continuing to be in a higher growth environment than we have been in that in that kind of post financial crisis decade. Then you have the ability to carry more inventory and invest a little bit more in having a more robust and resilient supply chain. So you anticipated my next question, which is, you know, there's this mismatch between um, transportation and you know stuff moving into the market versus uh, maybe a little bit of, if not positivity, at least kind of you know, recovery of mood within manufacturing. Do we run the risk of getting ourselves back into an inventory predicament and, you know, building more than the market's going to take away here in the, in the short term? 
I don't know if we do in the short term, but we definitely over the medium to longer term run that type of risk potentially. Okay. Uh, just because it's hard to know where that, as as Michael kind of hit on, what that right middle ground is. Yep. The optimist in me says, well, we have a lot better technology today to do predictive forecasting and who knows what's going to happen with how AI and machine learning is going to help with predictive yep. forecasting. But maybe our tools are better now than they were previously to help us try and manage those situations. So if you are able to have a sense of, hey, demand is starting to tick down a little bit, let's start slowing down how frequently we're kind of ordering to get resupplied on things, well then that, that'll help us be smarter when it comes to, to managing inventory and thus managing cash. Yeah. And I think that's a great point, right? I, I do think that long-term that there is a risk, but the, the, the data that is available to manufacturers of all sizes, small, medium, and large now, it's unbelievable. And, and by doing forecasting and budgeting and cash flow analysis and sensitivity analysis, you can kind of start to understand the variability in the market, right? If, if things start to soften, what does it mean to my PL? What does it mean to my cash flow? If, if things stay strong, what do my inventory levels have to look like? Um, so I do think there are tools out there that'll help companies work through that, but I, I do understand that there's a risk moving forward. Yeah. Well, I, I'm glad you mentioned AI, Simeon, because I, I do think to your point, Michael, about the data we have, those two combined AI with the data, now we're able to make sense of the data, right? In in a better way than we have been in the in the past. Absolutely. For sure. Okay, so we've got this kind of mixed picture in the manufacturing world. Let's let's back up to the 10,000 foot level and talk overall economy. So what are you guys seeing with the direction of the economy and where do you think that's gonna lead us in the manufacturing world? Yeah, I'll, I'll lead if, if yeah, I think this is right up your alley. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. <laughs> so, so we uh, we released an annual outlook earlier this year in January, and we try and make updates to that on a relatively frequent basis and how we're looking at things as additional data comes in. And, and where we are today is that we think there's a slightly better than 50-50 chance that we will not have a recession in the next 12 months. A year ago, we would think that we were probably 65 to 75 percent that we would have had a recession. So we are in a much better position. And the reason for being positive is candidly is that most consumers are doing pretty well. We are getting supply chains worked out. And so the manufacturing sector is improving and the services part of the economy continues to be relatively resilient. So in general, we're in a, we're in a pretty good place and we still have some spending that will happen from, um, from programs that have been launched by the, by the government to encourage more manufacturing and, and just economic health. Um, so those are all positives. We are also, there are reasons for caution, commercial real estate and what's going to happen there. Yeah. The fact that banks who make a lot of loans into commercial real estate are paring back on their activities. So it's not just pulling back on commercial real estate, but just a lot of the loan activity overall, they're gonna be a lot more uh, scrupulous and, and focusing on. So that's gonna potentially slow us down some. And then we do have, uh, the lower income consumers are already pointing to showing stress and, and that's an issue. And th then the last part is what will happen with inflation, which will dictate what happens with the Federal Reserve and interest rates. And mm -hmm. what we're starting to see now is, you know, nearly um, a year and a half, two years after the Fed started raising rates, we're starting to see that impact parts of the economy. Right. So uh, housing transactions have been slowed pretty materially, even though we're starting to see some green shoots there but also uh, the automotive sector appears to be slowing down pretty significantly. So a lot of those sectors which rely upon financing, we are starting to see really pairing back, you know, real estate, commercial real estate being, being a third area. So it's, it's a mixed picture, but we tend to lean slightly on the more optimistic side. Okay. Yeah, and, and I think just anecdotally, just as we're out meeting with our manufacturers and talking about, you know, what are the challenges and what are the concerns that they're thinking about, right? And the reasons to be optimistic about the economy as it relates to manufacturing. You know, when we did the survey last year, three of the top four concerns for manufacturers was U.S. economy, global economy, um, and foreign trade. Well, yeah. we've been weathering those for a while now, and it hasn't had the impact that maybe we kind of thought again 16 months ago. We're in a period where we're expecting a decline in interest rates, right? I, well, we were not going to go back to free cash, um, right. but we are going to see more normalization of interest rates at least we expect, we're seeing an uptick in our manufacturers either strategically acquiring uh, new businesses or going through a transaction themselves. 
Um, we weren't seeing that six, eight, 10 months ago. And so we're starting to see that, that pick up again. And, and right now there's a bill in Congress for the section 174 capitalization of R&D costs. It's been a real burden for manufacturers. That bill passes, that drives innovation for manufacturers and frees up some additional cash. So I think there's a lot of reasons to be, again, cautiously optimistic on what's happening in the general economy. I'll add on the what Michael hit on with private equity and mergers and acquisitions. Uh, so big companies are gonna have a hard time acquiring other big companies. We've seen that from uh, what's going on with the FTC and, and some significant mergers, not just in technology and other areas. Right. That means that they're gonna be more interested in more of the tuck in acquisitions or the opportunities to go after small and medium sized companies. At the same time, uh, private equity firms really spent 2023 on the sidelines we anticipate there are gonna be more transactions. We're already starting to hear about things like the loan market opening up for them. So we would expect more of kind of going back to the 2018, 2019 type of environment when it comes to mergers and acquisitions activity with lower and mid-sized companies or smaller mid-sized companies. We would expect that to come back to us. And that has pros and cons. Uh, one of the good things though, is it tends to put a lot more capital into growth in, within those markets. And that can really benefit manufacturers, especially if you're aligned with firms that are looking to, if you are a supplier into a firm that's growing through M&A, you get this natural benefit of being able to supply more and more business as they grow. Okay. All right. So last quarter, we were pretty bullish. This quarter, we're not as bullish, but still cautiously optimistic. Um, closing thoughts then, Michael, um, what should manufacturers take away from what you're seeing right now? Yeah, I, I think it's, continue to be prepared, right? I, I think manufacturers have done a really good job weathering the storm to date. Continue to evaluate your cash flow. You know, we tell clients have a 13 week cash flow model built out. Do your sensitivity analysis. We talked about automation and AI. Make sure you're leveraging the data that's available to you. But I think there's, there's plenty of reason to be optimistic moving forward, for sure. Good, Simeon. Agreeing with Michael, there are plenty of reasons to be optimistic. There's some really powerful secular trends that we can align behind. Uh, we're seeing continued spending within manufacturing. There's a lot of excitement about being able to bring manufacturing back to either onshore or nearshore. That's great for labor. It's good for companies. And uh, it's a pretty benign environment. We do have some cyclical headwinds that we've talked about around some of the transportation. But overall, it's it's a relatively good position to be in today compared to where we might have been three, five, ten years ago. Okay. Well, guys, always educational. Thank you for joining us today here on Manufacturing Talks. Yeah, thanks, thank Jim. you for having us, Jim. Thanks for having I appreciate us. it. And as always, thanks to you in the audience. This is why we're here. Uh, we're here every Tuesday, sometimes even more often. Um, this was very educational, and I can't promise they're all going to be this educational, but, but they're all going to have a nugget of information that's worth having. So join us every Tuesday. We'll be here with uh, fresh guests. Thanks again. So long. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for tuning in to Manufacturing Talks with Jim Benoski. Watch for new episodes dropping every Tuesday. Don't forget to like, share, comment, and subscribe.